And perhaps as a way to begin uh, our conversation, uh, tell us a bit about uh, your, uh, your, your, your work as a UN uh, Special Advisor to the uh, UN on the Prevention of Genocide, a position uh, for which you served uh, for three years from 2004 to, to 2007. Yes, I was appointed by Secretary General Kofi Annan to occupy that position for the first time. It was a newly created position mm -hmm. at the time and it was a, a part-time position so I simultaneously had another job um, and it, uh, it was, you know, it had very few resources at the time. But it but was you and an assistant? Uh, two assistants. Two assistants, uh, yes. Um, and, and, and myself as part-time. And um, the, the job was basically to try to provide the Secretary General and through him, the Security Council, some early warning about situations that if left unattended uh, might uh, degenerate into something like genocide. Mm -hmm. And at first it was difficult um, to concentrate on, you know, to, to decide on which uh, conflicts to, to concentrate because everybody would say, well, but that's not genocide. But once I made it clear that my job was prevention, uh, that if I let all the elements uh, be present for genocide, then by definition I haven't prevented it. Uh, okay. And so we actually focused on situations where vulnerable populations were at risk of something akin to genocide. And if the populations could be identified by their ethnicity or their race or nationality or national origin um, or religion, uh, then we would act and, uh, and we, we, we had the responsibility of offering not only early warning but also suggestions for early action. And so um, we ended up doing uh, some serious work around the Darfur situation, although obviously the, the worst part of that had happened before I was appointed. But uh, as you remember, in 2004, 2005, 2006, the situation in Darfur was very volatile mm -hmm. and it could have erupted into more, uh, and more genocide. Um, even then. The other problem was that uh, I was instructed not to qualify the situation. And, uh, but actually I thought that that was uh, a benefit because uh, I could say um, I'm not accusing uh, any country of genocide. I'm just saying that if the situation does, is not addressed, properly addressed by the international community, it could result in genocide. So uh, when Kofi Annan ended his term, and I was already holding basically two jobs. Uh, it was just too much work. So I uh, succeeded in getting a really good blueprint as to, you know, from the experiment itself as to what the new, the office should look like. And uh, we succeeded in getting the position to be full time. But I told Mr. Ban Ki moon that uh, he should have liberty to appoint his own special advisor and to offer it as a full time position. Yeah. But he, I also recommended that he should, uh, you know, dedicate more resources, not just making it full time, but more more staff and more uh, mm -hmm. and more other resources. Has it happened? And it has happened. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I'm pr proud to say that my successor Francis Deng um, does have a full time position and uh, quite a bit more resources than I have, and so I think that the. The position is very much now a part of the secretariat, and uh, and uh, it has a, a you know a, a position within the secretariat that allows it to allows Mr. Deng to you know make recommendations on a timely basis uh, within the secretariat and through the secretary general to the Security mm -hmm. Council as well. And and why was the position initially created? I mean, what was the need for? Uh for his position? Well, it, it actually came from the, the self-criticism that the UN uh, involved in after the failure to prevent uh, the genocide in Rwanda and in Srebrenica. Mm -hmm. And particularly in Rwanda, as you remember, there was a, a report uh, headed by uh, former Prime Minister Carlson from Sweden that in addition to calling you know, the, you know, the, the tragedy of not being able to stop the genocide, it actually identified certain missing elements in the setup of the United Nations. And uh, there were several um, meetings where uh, some function to prevent genocide was discussed. And essentially, 
in the 10th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, uh, the, the Secretary General announced uh, at a special session of the uh, Commission, then the Commission of Human Rights, uh, that he was creating this position. And um, to my surprise, he appointed me to it. Mm -hmm. And, and so you said that at the time you had very few resources, so you know, why, when you're in charge of trying to prevent genocide, I mean, and that you have few resources, how do you go about it? I mean, do you have enough money to go to the field? I mean, how, the, how do you prevent genocide with hardly any resources? What are your tools? Well, uh, uh, as I said, it was, uh, it was uh, conceived of as an experiment. And so we had to make the most of the resources that we had and uh, a lot of uh, the idea behind the creation of the office was to make it uh, you know, sort of a focal point within the secretariat. So the resources were, if you will, multiplied by the fact that, especially because Kofi Annan had made it a very personal issue of his, that prevention of genocide should be an important uh, fact of, uh, of everyday life at the secretariat, it wasn't difficult for me to get my phone calls answered, for example. Mm -hmm. Everybody that I went to in the secretariat was willing to help. Uh, obviously, it's one thing to, to be the focal point and having to go uh, after the information and the advice. Uh, what needs to happen, and I hope it is happening now, but you know, I'm, I'm not there now, is for the contrary flow to happen as well, that is for uh, people working in different uh, line units of the Secretariat or even of the UN family um, to remember that there is a, 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 a special advisor on prevention of genocide and to call him and tell him, look, there's this situation that's brewing. You should, this is uh, the information that we have. Uh, get involved. Uh, t t tell us what you need to get involved. And, that, at, at, at least as of when I left, was not happening yet. Mm -hmm. But you know, a culture of prevention takes some time to, okay, be, to be installed. And, uh, and I think the, the, the first three years were a step in the right direction. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, I'm happy to say that recommendations for strengthening the office were heeded. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, uh, I don't think we can say that we are now in a position where genocide will be prevented from happening under all and every circumstance, but I think the United Nations is better equipped to deal mm -hmm. with it. And how do you make uh, the, the determination that uh, here uh, there, there is a risk uh, that uh, a genocide could well, happen? Well, I Kofi mean, How do you gather the information and how do you qualify the situation as uh, a risky situation? Right. Well, the Secretary General told me that uh, there was a lot of information flowing all the time in the Secretariat and I should uh, definitely you know, use it. Uh, but he also told me to get the information from whatever source I could, uh, I could use. And I thought as long as, you know, that made, put a lot of burden on me to make sure that the information was credible. The problem with the information uh, within the Secretariat is that there's a lot of it, but it's not organized uh, in terms of prevention of genocide. It, it's just flow of information, and 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 it's uh, it it comes from very different sources. It's not in a single place yeah. where you can. There are some attempts to systematize and organize, and so so we did get get uh, make use of that. But by and large, we had to get the information and also analyze it ourselves, and um, and then get more information, you know, get, get additional information. But as I said, we started from the. Uh, concept of population at risk. And we tried to identify the population uh, that was at risk by ethnicity, national origin, race, or religion. And once we found that, uh, that a, a minority or even a majority of the population in a given country was at risk of very serious human rights abuses, uh, then we made it a focal point. We made it a, a point of following it on a daily basis. And if we understood the situation to be you know, on a trend towards deterioration, then we called upon the political organs of the UN to take some intervention on it. And I did it through the Secretary General, of course. And did you have a chance to, did you have the possibility to go uh, uh, on the ground and try to get oh, yeah. information? Yeah, but yes, that's part and, of the Monday too. We did. Sometimes uh, it was more important to do it more or less quietly mm -hmm. through my staff 
Uh, for example, my staff visited uh, Côte d'Ivoire early on, uh, and uh, I sent them also to the Thai border with Burma. Uh, we visited, I myself visited uh, Darfur a couple of times and Côte d'Ivoire with my staff mm -hmm. a second time. Um, but, you know, it's not so much, uh, it is important, of course, to, to visit because it gives you a sense of... Uh, of uh, the dynamics of the situation and, and of the urgency, but you know if you insist too much on seeing uh, on, on on being there without taking some other kind of action, yes. what you get is the government's uh, you know uh, resisting that. And if you have in the title of your in your title you have the word genocide, mm -hmm. it's not the it's easiest. not a good calling card. No, no, it's a. Uh, it, 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 you know, people pay attention, but yes. they try to prevent you from doing your yeah, work so rather, than, no, rather than helping you. So uh, we we found ways of doing our work mm. without, uh, you know, without seeming to stigmatize uh, before it was already mm. necessary to stigmatize. And for example, I was never able to go the, to the DRC because, mm -hmm. uh, for one reason or another, there was there was it was never the right time to for the advisor on prevention of genocide to be in the DRC. But nevertheless, we did work on the DRC, and we, we had very good information coming via the, the, the country sure. teams there and the, and the special representative and all that. And so we were able to put in our five cents worth of mm -hmm. advice in the councils within the Secretary General's office where decisions about the yeah. DRC were being taken. And, and so what were the cases during 2004 and 2007 uh, on which you brought attention? So uh, Sudan, well, DRC? Well, yeah, uh, there, were, there were several. Uh, there were, uh, I would say, Sudan, uh, especially Darfur, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, <coughs> the DRC, uh, Burma, Colombia, uh, especially in Colombia, more specifically with regards to indigenous populations that were at risk, mm -hmm. uh, where the special rapporteur on, on indigenous populations uh, requested my intervention. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think, uh, I mean, we intervened uh, one way or another, I mean, uh, with diff different degrees of intensity in something like 15 different countries. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so once you, you, you have made a determination that uh, there is a risk, I mean, what's the, what's the, the, the procedure? So you, 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 you bring attention to the Secretary General, yeah, to my, his well, office, and then what happens? My terms of reference uh, called upon me to provide an early warning, but especially emphasize early action. Uh -huh. So I had the responsibility of saying something is going to happen, but also to come up with ideas that would alter the course of events so that it didn't happen. And uh, that was harder because, you know, some things that work in one context may be counterproductive yeah. in another. So it's uh, it was it, it 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 meant that we needed to have a whole lot more, you know, expert advice uh, from people who knew the background to the country and to the conflict. And so we were able to to get a sense of, uh, you know, factors that could accelerate or uh, decelerate or, you know, or, or um, ameliorate the problem. And the, the literature on prevention of genocide uh, does have some sense of those accelerating and decelerating factors. And so we tried to use some of those concepts. Uh, it, I have to say that it wasn't all that difficult to find uh, experts uh, on country situations. Um, and to find them on a volunteer basis because mm -hmm. everybody wanted to prevent genocide. So, yeah. um, and especially in a city like New York, there's always somebody who's following this most recondite mm -hmm. and remote place on earth and uh, who knows all about it and can give you good advice. So, and you know, because this, it carried the weight of a UN body and, and I was the special advisor to a secretary general who himself uh, had a reputation for human rights and for prevention of genocide. Uh, it wasn't difficult to have uh, people helping me. And, and then, uh, so when you were uh, uh, assessing that there was a danger here and there, so you would just alert the office of the secretary general, the secretary general himself, but you didn't have to go in front of the security council. Well. Um, 
I mean, we had to use the presence before the Security Council advisedly and, and sparingly because the Security Council, uh, they, I was told from the start that they don't want to be a human rights uh, mechanism. They, they will want to hear about human rights if, uh, if it helps them un understand the situation of peace and security that they have to deal with. Mm. Uh, and I I in practice what happened was that if the Security Council was already seized of the situation, we would send notes to the Secretary General and the Secretary General would forward them to the Security Council. And if I had, uh, I was just returning from a recent trip, for example, I would ask to brief the Security Council, mm -hmm. which I did on, on a couple of occasions, once in Darfur uh, and another one on, on general uh, situations of prevention of genocide. Uh, unfortunately, the second time I went to Darfur, I was prevented from briefing the Security Council by the votes of some Security Council mm -hmm. members. Because they didn't want you to bring this issue to the attention. Well, I mean, they were, they, I, they I, I think different the, members have different agenda. reasons. Yes, the problem yes. was that the president at the time, uh, that month of the Security Council, wanted to decide this by consensus. Of course, it's a procedural matter, so he could have decided on his own or by majority. Uh, and the majority of the countries did want to listen to me. But there were some objections. Um, some on, uh, you know, on the fact that I had already spoken publicly about Darfur. Some, uh, the fact that my title of prevention of genocide, uh, you know, would make it look like Sudan was already involved in genocide. Yeah. And, and then, uh, unexpectedly, the, 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 uh, the permanent representative of the United States, John Bolton, objected to my to my briefing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, later the people from his office came to see me and told me that they didn't intend to, you know, to discourage me from coming to the Security Council and that they would support it. But I think it was just a kind of spur of the moment. He, mm -hmm. he just didn't want to hear from, from the Secretary General's office. Um, because but the position is part of the uh, Secretary General's uh, office. Yes, yes, it yes, is, yes, of yes. course, and a special advisor to the Secretary mm -hmm. General. And there was somebody else already briefing, and he said something like, why do we need two? We yes. have one of them can tell us whatever they have to tell us. And it was very unfortunate, because that stiffened the resolve of the other members who didn't want to hear mm -hmm. me for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a wrong reason also, but, yeah. but I mean <laughs> for even worse reasons yeah, than yeah. that. Uh, and, 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 and what's worse is that it really... Uh, created a very bad precedent for the future because now every country that wanted to protect another country would object to to mm -hmm. to my briefing and so it, it, after that it became a lot harder for me to to brief the Security Council mm -hmm. and the whole idea of creating this position which by the way was created at the behest of the Security Council because in 2001 the Security Council had issued a resolution 1366 in which the Security Council called upon the Secretary General to bring to its attention situations that if left unattended could deteriorate mm -hmm. into genocide. And so the position was created in response to that uh, resolution. So the, the whole idea of having a, a special advisor on prevention of genocide was to be able to be close to the Security Council and come up with, obviously you're not gonna be there every week, but mm -hmm. uh, whenever you have something to say, the Security Council should listen. And uh, that uh, bad move by John Bolton really backtracked the whole yeah. situation. Uh, and it's been a lot harder to brief the Security Council since then. Since then. Yes. And, and, and is there an example of, uh, of where precisely, uh, when you were in charge of the office, the office, your position, your, your actions really, uh, you know, Prevented genocide. I mean, you know, is the case well, where the office made a, a very significant difference while well, you were there? I mean, it was very frustrating, uh, as you can imagine, uh, because you don't, uh, whatever success you might have accomplished, it, re it was really part of a complex web of different factors that may have uh, had some influence. Uh, it was, it's the, the, you, you, you don't prevent genocide by a single action, by a single office or individual. 
Uh, but I, I do believe that we contributed, and especially we contributed to the discussion about what needed mm -hmm. to happen. Um, Mr. Annan invited me, you know, when topics of my interest were discussed, to what he called the policy committee, which is a, you know, kind of like a, a kitchen cabinet of the Secretary General that he called uh, relatively frequently, like once a month or every three weeks. Mm -hmm. And if the agenda had anything in which I was working, he would call on me, and I participated in those discussions. He would always ask me and the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, for our views before framing the whole decisions that the Secretary General was going to to uh, uh, to apply. Yeah. And sometimes those decisions were going to the Security Council. Sometimes were implementation of. Uh, things already on the ground because by and large in these situations there was a peacekeeping operation going on. And I think I had a very good working relationship with DPKO, the D Department of Peacekeeping Operations, with uh, OCHA, the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, with the Department of Political Affairs, with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And so although I was kind of single-mindedly focused on prevention of genocide, um, my participation in the discussions in which all of these offices were involved, I, I think probably, you know, uh, helped uh, generate uh, some good decisions. Now, you never know whether you prevented genocide or not, because by definition, what did not happen, yes. you know, yes. it, it didn't happen. Yes. So, um, and, you know, uh, during my time, at least, there wasn't any uh, situation that uh, that we had to lament, like yeah. Rwanda or yeah. Srebrenica. Yeah. But uh, it may well be that there won't be situations like that anymore. Yeah. Whether you had a you have a good uh, office of prevention of genocide yeah. or not. And so you left in 2007, and since then, of course, you know, you cannot really speak for the office now because you left four years ago, but, but do you think that the, the, the activity of the office has grown? I mean, how do you, uh, what's your sense of uh, uh, the work of the office and well, the, I, I, the, way, or the awareness on, on when it comes to prevention I, I, of genocide? I remained uh, part of what is called an advisory committee to the to the secretary general on prevention of genocide for a couple of years after I left the office. Yes. So you know the but work. I'm not, yeah, but I'm no longer a part of that y committee. Yes. And so um, I, I I have no basis of information to say mm -hmm. whether you know uh, w what I am encouraged to, uh, by is the fact that the office is now firmly entrenched and and uh, you know better resourced. Uh, it's now. Uh, other than that, I just can't uh, can't really comment because I don't. Uh, uh, as you know, it has been now reinforced also by a, a special advisor on responsibility to protect, mm -hmm. and I think the whole debate uh, at the general assembly that was kind of geared by the special advisor uh, on on behalf of the secretary general contributed a lot to to generating this culture of prevention that we were talking about a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so my sense is that the Secretariat now has tools. Um, well, I'm sure they can be improved upon, but uh, um, not being there, I cannot comment on, yeah. on how effective they're being. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship between the special advisor on the responsibility to protect and and the Office uh, on the Prevention of Genocide, do they work together? I mean, well, uh, uh, as, as I said, I mean, uh, the, the, the second of the offices was created after my time. Yes. Uh, why, is, why is such a need for another office? Well, that's what uh, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon decided. Yes. I think uh, part of the problem was that, as you know, the responsibility to protect was a doctrine that was approved unanimously in the summit outcome document of 2005, yeah. but almost immediately there's, there's some pushback by some countries, uh, mm -hmm. some states uh, began. And so it was very important to uh, re-engage the debate about mm -hmm. what responsibility to protect was. And I think Edward Luck has been good, very good about that, has uh, provided quite a bit of intellectual force into what does it mean to have uh, a doctrine that's called responsibility to protect. And uh, 
you know, from my perspective, it was almost discouraging that you had to have that debate after the summit outcome document had yes. approved it As if uh, unanimously. Happened, yes. But, yes, but unfortunately, that was uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the way uh, things happened, and uh, and it was important to re-engage and. And, and, and as a good result of the re-engagement with the discussion, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, many states reaffirmed the responsibility to protect, I would say a, a, a very wide majority of mm -hmm. states reaffirmed it and reaffirmed their, their commitment to it, um, actually probably boosted the ability of the Secretary General's office to be able to to respond to crises in which uh, loss of life is imminent. Uh, why was it necessary up to 2005 to somehow uh, recommit uh, while, you know, in 2005? Well, it shouldn't have been necessary, yes. but the fact is that the there were states, states that were, were pushing not, back. Uh, member states were not paying attention in the context of the 2005 uh, summit? Or? Uh, well, I've, I've uh, heard uh, different interpretations, mm -hmm. but yes, uh, one of the interpretations is that they they were concentrating their fire on other aspects of the reform mm -hmm. and succe succeeded in you know in uh, undermining it for example the human rights council and, yeah. uh, but also um, uh, they they were basically uh, you know trying to to prevent uh, uh, serious reform from happening in those areas yeah. and they kind of let go yeah. on yeah. responsibility to protect. And then afterwards they revisited the and issue. And then they revisited. And yes. the need to somehow recommit uh, member states. Yeah, to make and sure also, that, uh, unfortunately, they, they, they took the position, some of these states took the position that responsibility to protect was all about foreign intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is not the case. It, no, it's not the case at all. And uh, on the contrary, it's, uh, you know, if you read it, the, the summit outcome document carefully, um, the uh, uh, non-consensual armed intervention is completely last resort, absolutely last resort. And but even last, uh, as a last resort, uh, you know, you 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 cannot uh, take it out completely mm -hmm. because sometimes it's the only thing that's going to save uh, a lot of lives. And the international community cannot. Uh, allow you know misunderstood uh, notions of sovereignty from interfering with uh, saving yeah. lives yeah. Yeah. and so but but uh, but i think the the responsibility to protect is very clear in that it it puts first and foremost the responsibility on the on the territorial state second on the international community to come to the aid of the state that is willing but unable to protect its population and only in the third instance, uh, the, re the responsibility shifts to the international community when the state is not only unwilling, uh, unable, but also unwilling to protect. But even in that third situation, the, the responsibility to protect document very clearly says that all of these things have to be done within the powers mm -hmm. uh, that international law assigns to the Security Council and to, and to the political organs more generally. So in, by no means is it a carte blanche to mm -hmm. powerful countries or coalitions of the willing to do whatever they want. It, it just, there's, there's no support for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, um, so, so now you, you, you have been since November 2010, so uh, less than a year. Less than a the, year. The uh, UN Special Rapporteur on, on Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman and Degrading Treatment or Punishment, which is the uh, UN official, uh, yes, 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 but for essentially you focus on, on being the, the UN rapporteur on torture. Right. So, you know, uh, how, for how many years is the appointment? To three. Be it's for three, three uh, renewable ones, yes. for another three. And you, you just mentioned that it's a pro bono job. Yes, a volunteer. A volunteer yeah. job, yes. And, and so, so, so what does it mean to be the, the, the UN, uh, or a UN special rapporteur on torture? Well, I mean, What's the job about? Well, the, uh, special rapporteurs are part of what, what are called special procedures or, mm -hmm. or also called charter-based as opposed to treaty-based mechanisms. And they, used, they were created back in the 80s um, under the old Commission on Human Rights and they have been inherited by the Human Rights Council. Uh, essentially, uh, they are uh, procedures uh, to be able to deal with the whole world and, and not be restricted by... 
by having a mandate that restricted to treaty signers and and, and parties to treaties. Uh, so uh, there are something like 36 or 37 mandates, I think, uh, currently in operation. And uh, the one on torture is one of the oldest ones. It's more than 25 years old now. And in the past, it has been held by very by four different uh, very prominent European jurists. I'm, and the first Latin American, uh, the first non-European, I should say, yeah. to hold this position. Um, and who were the Europeans who were holding this position? Uh, Coymans from mm -hmm. Holland, uh, Nigel Rodley from Britain, mm -hmm. uh, Van Boven also from Holland, mm -hmm. and uh, Manfred Nowak from Austria, mm -hmm. who was the most recent uh, yeah. rapporteur. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> all of them did uh, excellent uh, jobs. Uh, they really set a very high standard for the office, which I find it challenging, of course, but also I, uh, on the positive side, I think it's a good platform from where yeah. to work. You know, um, and uh, the, 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 the special rapporteurship on torture is uh, perhaps one of the most uh, demanding ones because it's so well known and it has such a good trajectory that a lot of people use it. So. Literally, we get more than half of all the requests for action uh, from the public that reporterships get. Of all the 36 of them, we get more than half of them. So to give you an idea of how active the, the reportership is. But we do uh, actions in individual cases when we are, uh, you know, after examining their credibility. Uh, we either do an urgent action or a, what's called an allegation letter. And, and then we enter into a, an engagement with the state that is confidential in the early part of the, of the process, but then uh, ends in a report to the Human Rights Council that is uh, public. Um, and then the, the second way in which we do our work is uh, by fact-finding missions mm -hmm. uh, to countries that invite us. And the third is uh, I do two reports a year, one to the General Assembly and one to the Human Rights Council. And in those reports, I can uh, take uh, an issue related to torture and um, elaborate on it and make suggestions and recommendations to states and to the international community about what can be done about that particular issue in order to help states live up to their obligations under the mm -hmm. uh, international law regarding uh, torture. So, for example, in the uh, report that I am going to present to the General Assembly in October, I'm going to dedicate it to the issue of solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. and, and so, do you have a team for this? Because once again, that's yeah. not your primary job, you know. So, do you no, I, there is a, there are some resources uh, allocated by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So, Geneva. the work is being done in Geneva. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Office of, among many other things that the Office of the High Commissioner does, they support all the special procedures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they've assigned uh, uh, a couple of people to work with me on a full-time basis. And, uh, you know, the, I can o obviously avail myself of other uh, resources um, within reason, obviously, because uh, you don't want to create the impression that you know, that you get a lot of uh, support from uh, outside sources. Mm -hmm. But uh, being in a university position, obviously students are very eager to work with you and so you... So they can help you and so You on. can do some research yes. through your students, yes. yes. And, and so what kind of, ca I mean, you know, because torture is a big topic, I mean, you know, once again, uh, all the cases that you look into are cases which are brought to you I mean, how does it work? I mean, uh, or do you really uh, yourself have to, do you have to identify cases? Or are, they such, are, they, are these cases brought to you, or do you have to? Well, we receive communications from the public. Okay. And uh, we examine them, and if we find them credible, we either write an urgent action, say, for example, somebody mm -hmm. has been arrested, and uh, the, the presumption is that that person is being tortured. Uh, or... Uh, and torture having to do with political uh, situations? Or well, any kind my mandate extends to more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any kind of situation. It doesn't have to be politically motivated. Mm -hmm. um, 
And because my mandate includes also other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment, uh, a lot of it has to do with prison conditions, mm -hmm. uh, where there's no intention of you know, inflicting deliberate pain and suffering on someone for the purpose of um, extracting confessions or information or for punishment, yes. but the general conditions of the, uh, um, of the detention uh, are such that they involve cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Mm -hmm. And so the mandate is huge, as you can imagine, yes. because prison conditions are bad in many, many countries. And some are bad because of you know, lack of resources or, or just neglect. Uh, but, for example, if someone is in, in a prison with very unsanitary conditions, that can amount to cruel, inhuman, and degrading mm -hmm. treatment, even if no one is particularly, you know, applying violence yes, to someone. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and also, even in places, in countries with uh, a good level of resources, uh, sometimes the prison conditions involve, you know, deliberate uh, attempts to break the will of of uh, unruly inmates mm -hmm. through um, through disciplinary punishment that involves uh, isolation or solitary confinement, and under some circumstances that can be cruel, inhuman, and degrading, uh, especially if there's no reason for it other than punishment. Uh, but it also can amount to torture because. Uh, uh, the definition of torture involves not only physical but also psychological harm. Mm -hmm. So, if and and the psychological harm doesn't have to be suffered immediately; it could it can be suffered suffered down the road. Yeah. So that's why I'm looking at solitary confinement because the literature seems to show that if you if you keep somebody for 22, 23 hours every day in a sort of sensory deprivation situation. Um, and you do it for a prolonged period of time, uh, the consequences on that person's person uh, mental health can be very bad. Absolutely. Yeah. How many cases are you handling per year? Because you mentioned that out of the 37 uh, mandates, 36 or 37 mandates, uh, uh, your, uh, I mean, your well, mandate receives... Uh, yeah, well, I have a statistic for the last calendar year, mm -hmm. uh, 2010. The, all of the mandates uh, issued, I think, some a little over 600 communications to states, and 300 and yeah, ab about 300 were signed by my office. Yeah. and so so. But uh, that uh, some of them were joint. Huh? Yes, uh, yes, So yes. it doesn't mean that all uh, no, 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 all the other yes. 35 yeah. did the I other 300. Napping on the side and yeah. uh, and, and, and so. Uh, besides the, 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 the report that you present in front of the GA, besides the report that you present in front of the Human Rights Commissions, and besides these communications uh, which you send to the states, I mean, you, what are the, you know, what are the, the co what are the, do you have additional concrete means of actions to make sure that... Uh, well, I mean, uh, 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 mandate holders, both uh, special rapporteurs and working groups, are considered independent experts, mm -hmm. and uh, so n nobody, n neither the Human Rights Council nor the Secretary General nor any authority in the United Nations uh, can tell them what to say and what not to say. So in essence, we are actually expected to act as independent experts and to speak out whenever we think we need to speak out. So. Uh, on many occasions, uh, obviously after respecting the, 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 the procedures, especially the confidential parts of the procedures, uh, but I speak out whenever the press or the media wants to talk to me about a, a given situation, yes. um, or we actually issue press releases when there's something urgent, like during the, the Arab Spring right now, we we had occasion, several of us, the uh, Special Rapporteur on Executions, uh, on Freedom of Expression, uh, there's n a new one on Freedom of Assembly, uh, and we, uh, on Human Rights Defenders, for example, we would issue uh, press releases uh, calling on states to refrain from disproportionate use of violence in, uh, in curbing demonstrations in Egypt, in Tunisia, mm -hmm in Morocco, in uh, Syria, 
in Bahrain, in Yemen. So uh, we've been very busy with that because for me, if, if in the course of a demonstration, uh, excessive use of force is used and people are wounded, that's, that also falls within my mandate because mm -hmm. it constitutes cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these uh, 600, 300 communications, I mean, so they are directed to, in, I mean, uh, statistically to which region? I mean, do they go to, to Europe, to the U.S., to Asia? I mean, you know, is there, is there uh, a significant uh, geographical distribution? I, I don't have a breakdown no. of the 300, but, uh, but I can tell you that we work on every country, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, on every region of the world, not yeah. on every country, but... Uh, I do have jurisdiction, quote unquote, mm -hmm. uh, over 193 countries. Mm -hmm. All now. countries. All countries. With Southern Sudan, it's 193. Yes. Uh, I mean, all countries that are members of the United Nations. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, sub uh, uh, as a subject matter, my jurisdiction is about torture and cruel and human and degrading treatment. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, there are situations just about everywhere where uh, states are at least alleged to have broken one or more of the obligations. I, you're talking about the obligation to refrain from torture and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, but also, uh, for example, the obligation to exclude evidence obtained uh, under torture or under, uh, under torture from judicial processes, uh, or uh, the obligation to refrain from sending somebody back to another country where mm -hmm. he or she could be yeah. uh, mm -hmm. subjected to torture. How do they call it? Um, Refoulement. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a specific obligation of the Refugee Convention, but also of the Torture Convention. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you can see that uh, even the most uh, sophisticated and modern and liberal countries can have yeah. occasions in which uh, at least an allegation is made yeah. uh, about this. Precisely, I mean, you know, in the past years in the U.S., we have talked a lot about the, the, the treatment of prisoners in the U.S. and, you know, uh, in countries alike with the U.S. Uh, in the context of the war against terror. Right. Does it fall under your mandate or not? Absolutely. So yeah. how do you handle the matter? Because it's a highly sensitive uh, topic from a political point of view. Yeah, well, I've been engaged with, in conversations with the government of the United States, and some of them as a, a, are still in stages in which are confidential, so I mm -hmm. can't disclose the content uh, of the conversations. But, uh, but I, can, I can confirm that I've been working, for example, on the issue of solitary confinement as it affects uh, private uh, Bradley Manning, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been publicly engaged in that conversation, trying to visit him. The, the, the gentleman who was uh, accused of leaking uh, yeah, That's right. Uh, he's, a soldier. Yes. he's a soldier who's accused of being the source of, of the leak to WikiLeaks mm. of, um, uh, of uh, private uh, confidential cables. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm classified cables of the United States Because government. he's in solitary confinement. Well, the, the allegation that I got was that he spent several months in solitary confinement in a, a, a brig, as they call it, a military prison mm -hmm. run by the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to see him. Uh, in the meantime, uh, he was moved to Fort Leavenworth in mm -hmm. Kansas. It's an army brig. Mm -hmm. And as I understand, the situation has improved considerably for him. Uh, but unfortunately, the government allowed me to visit him, but not on conditions that I could be assured of that my conversation with him would not be monitored. Mm -hmm. And so under the rules that the United Nations applies, I cannot accept that condition. Yes. I nevertheless, uh, through his lawyer, I told Mr. Manning that if he still wanted to see me, that I would see him under protest, but uh, in, in those conditions. But he declined also. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen him yet, um, but as I said, I'm following the situation, and I know that he's, uh, he's no longer under 22 hours alone mm -hmm. by himself in a cell like he was in Quantico. With light or without light? When you talk about solitary confinement, is it without light? Is it with light? Or, uh? Well, I mean, generally speaking, uh, the problem with the, the term solitary confinement is it describes so many different situations mm -hmm. that you have to come to some understanding of what you mean. 
as I understand it, in the case of Manning, uh, he had light. Uh, mm -hmm. He was in a but twenty four hours a day. Yeah, but by himself, with the only contact being with his mm -hmm. cards. Mm -hmm. So it's and and so it the literature shows that uh, long term solitary confinement really undermines the, the sanity of. Uh, of the prison well, it's it's a, it's a long-term solitary confinement affects uh, the socialization mm. of the, I mean the, the lack of society with. Yeah. Uh, with but other is it, is it, it's something which is uh, relatively widely practiced in the context of regular U.S. prisons too. Well, that's a, uh, that's an allegation that we're looking into yeah. as well. I mean, the, um, as a disciplinary form yeah. and a form of control. Uh, in fact, today there's a very good op-ed piece in the New York Times. Uh, precisely about that, because I didn't realize this, but apparently in California there's a, a hunger strike by people who are in the so-called special housing units, uh -huh. secure housing units, they call them, S uh, SHU, S-H-U. Those are the um, isolation cells uh, in many different prisons, federal and state prisons in the United States, uh, where people are uh, are taken uh, for disciplinary reasons or for reasons of control. And uh, we're looking into it. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said, I don't have... Um, my, my my study of solitary confinement mm -hmm. uh, is not about the United States. Yes, it's yes, about it's the way general, it's used yes. everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but I am talking also to the United States government about the use of solitary but confinement. But one would, one would assume that actually the practice of uh, solitary confinement is very much... Uh, uh, part of, of a relatively sophisticated uh, policies of, uh, yeah. of, 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 of imprisonment. Well, in, in some ways it, it's seen it as, it a, it, well, no, it is, it is uh, in some cases it's used as a way of not inflicting physical pain, mm -hmm. but also breaking the will yeah. of the prisoner. So it must, it must be part of a penal system which is quite sophisticated in a way. Well, well, no. I mean, it, it also it also it is also used in prisons that are uh, that are really ghastly in mm -hmm. terms of physical mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I what bothers me is that uh, if in the past in many countries around the world uh, the the prison rules called for pr solitary confinement of up to say two weeks at a time or three weeks at a time maximum. Mm -hmm even for the worst disciplinary offense, like striking a guard, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's a, a, a trend towards extending that. Mm -hmm. And countries that are generally benign in their treatment of prisoners, although you know, full of neglect as well, like in South America, they're moving towards up to two or three months of solitary confinement as a disciplinary measure at a time. And wh where does this trend come from? I mean, you know, I, a, a silly example, on, on US TV you have this program, I think it's called Lock Up. Lock on up the, yeah. and, 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 you know, once again, once, uh, once a while I, I, I watch it and it seems that it is a, uh, a practice which is quite uh, widely used as a term, uh, in terms of uh, uh, disciplinary measures. So, so you are telling us now that in, the, in Latin America this is something which is uh, increasingly practiced. So why is it the case? I mean, well, why is it viewed I, 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 as a... I think it's because prison authorities uh, resort to it as a kind of an easy way out to deal with gangs inside prisons, yes. for example, to break up gangs, mm -hmm. or to get uh, gang members to tell on others. Mm -hmm. And then you have to protect them from the gang so yes, you don't yes. send them back to the general prison population. Um, but that doesn't take away anything of the cruelty of uh, yes. having to be all by yourself for hours. And, and you view it as a psychological torture? Well, I think in some cases it's used uh, as a way of extracting confessions or, yes. or, or uh, damaging information about others. Mm -hmm. So in that case it's torture, mm -hmm. yes, uh, in the sense of the purpose of the, mm -hmm. of the measure. But even with the, with, with the, with the, if the purpose is other than that, um, I think I think it's important that if there's going to be any confinement at all, that it has to be very carefully regulated, mm -hmm. and for example, monitored by competent psychiatrists and, and medical doctors. Uh, the person who orders the solitary confinement has to be made responsible for the consequences. Has to have clear legal authority to to do it, and then 
And then, of course, it has to be limited in time. It cannot be, you know, indefinite yes, or, yes, yes. or lasting years mm -hmm. or, or, or months or even weeks. I think, uh, I, I think uh, you know, it, it may be necessary in some moment uh, for either disciplinary purpose or for protection mm -hmm. of the inmate himself to isolate him from the prison population. But um, if, if, if those cases are not carefully regulated, they can end up uh, being a, so, a yes. sort of sensory deprivation that is just as harmful as physical torture. You are from Latin America, and you mentioned that uh, you know, the practice of solitary confinement is being uh, somehow increasingly used. I mean, what, what's the situation uh, of prisons in Latin America? I mean, uh, I, I read uh, different kind of stories about uh, the fact that it, it, you know, in, in, in many countries it's, it's really got quite, it's, it's tough. Well, what, happened, what has happened in Latin America is in the last quarter century we've had a move towards democracy, but democracy uh, has not necessarily improved the, you know, the kind of the, uh, the economic well-being yeah. of the population. And so countries, uh, states have been strapped for resources and unfortunately prisons are always the last priority of any country. And uh, within that I have to say, however, that the good thing is in Latin America uh, there is a very vibrant civil society mm -hmm. and a very, uh, very good public discussion of, of, of issues and poli public policy. And Across Latin America, uh, there's there's at least attention to prisons, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and there are lawyers and, and NGOs willing to defend the rights of inmates, in just about every Latin American country. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, and then then in, you take country by country, and you'll find some efforts to improve the situation, to build prisons that are humane. Uh, but in the same country, in another province or in another region, uh, a very ghastly situation. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the corrections officers and the police are the institutions of the state have, that have been the least reformed since the, the return of democracy. Uh, the armed forces generally have been reformed in most Latin American countries, and the police, there's been some attempts at reform, yeah. some more successful than others. But the corrections office, uh, uh, I mean, uh, corrections um, uh, forces have not been reformed almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so you have a combination of lack of priority, uh, neglect, mm -hmm. v uh, limited resources, and bad training and bad recruitment of, uh, so of it, people. It and, 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 and of course, an outcry from the population that feels um, under threat from crime yeah. for tougher measures. And so the, that toxic combination of mm -hmm. factors makes it such that uh, people would rather not even know what's yeah. going on in yeah. prisons. Yeah. And then you have explosive situations, you have overcrowding, mm -hmm. you have uh, really unsanitary conditions, um, and then you have sometimes riots, yeah. and riots that are handled in the worst possible yeah. way. Perhaps as a way to end our, our conversation, uh, your latest book, uh, it's entitled Taking a Stand, uh, The Evolution of Human Rights. So first of all, why such a book? I mean, is it a way for you to uh, recapitulate what has been your uh, intellectual and professional journey uh, in the past years? I mean, uh, because it covers quite a bit of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of topics. Of course, you, you talk about uh, what have been the topics at the core of your work in the field of yeah. uh, prevention of genocide. So you talk about detention. There's a chapter on detention, another one on torture, disappearances, yeah. uh, genocide accountability, but you also talk about immigration and solidarity. So why this book and why this variety of, 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 uh, of topics and what is the connection between these topics which are quite various? Well, I've been very fortunate that I've been working uh, full-time professionally on human rights protection and I've been fortunate to work on uh, from many different, you know, uh, positions and, and uh, trenches as it were. Uh, from working in my own country in very yeah. difficult conditions to being a victim myself of torture mm -hmm. and uh, arbitrary detention, from being able to enjoy the solidarity of people that allowed my situation to be shortened at least, uh, from being received in a society like the United States uh, with a lot of solidarity, 
and then being able to work uh, so on many situations. So the theme itself is part of your own personal story. In, in a way that, that the 11 chapters are what I consider very important issues of human rights mm -hmm. even, even today, but each chapter reflects my personal experience as well as my ideas of, of what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And so chronologically it starts with detention, mm -hmm. but then it goes on to torture. And those two chapters, obviously, the, the personal part of them um, uh, are what happened to me in Argentina. So tell us a bit about this precisely, because you started as a lawyer uh, yeah. during the dictatorship in the late... Yeah, uh, well, I actually started as a lawyer before the dictatorship, mm -hmm. and uh, I practiced law for maybe five or six years. And then uh, when things were getting worse and worse, I was defending political prisoners and and uh, calling attention to issues of torture, and uh, I was arrested myself. Um, mm -hmm. and so that was between, the dictatorship was between 1973 and 1976, basically. Oh, no, 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 76 no, uh, no, all I the way to 1980. Yeah, that's yeah, right. The dictatorship, is, uh, dictatorship started in 76, yes, March that's correct. 24 of 1976. Yes. But I was arrested in August of 1975. Mm. So one year before. Under the government of Maria Isabel Perón. Mm -hmm. uh, that was already a very repressive government. It mm -hmm. was constitutionally elected, uh, but it, was, it had deteriorated into a very repressive government. And torture was rampant, and paramilitary groups uh, mm -hmm. committed uh, killings uh, every day. Uh, but I was fortunate enough, because uh, my situation was not all that uh, rare, because lawyers like me who defended political prisoners were a very distinct target of repression in 75 but then later even more. Mm -hmm. uh, at last count there's at least 110 or 115 lawyers counted among the disappeared, mm -hmm. many of them my friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, another 100... So they would be picked up one night and then yeah. never to be seen again. That's right. Mm -hmm. And another 100 or so who like me spent some time in, in prolonged arbitrary detention without trial. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, it was 18 months because of international solidarity that brought me out. But the average of people in my situation was three or four years without trial mm -hmm. in, in arbitrary detention. And many of them, as I said, about 100 of them lawyers. Uh, and then impossible to count how many left the country rather than being killed yes. uh, and went into exile. So my situation... Um, was, uh, as I said, uh, I, I was arrested under the Isabel uh, Perón regime, but I stayed a whole year in prison during the Videla, the government of General Videla. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, where they, they had many, many prisoners and many disappeared persons, and they started having a little bit of pressure uh, from abroad. Amnesty International adopted me as a prisoner of conscience, and uh, my case was highlighted in the only mission that Amnesty was able to conduct to Argentina in late 1976. Mm -hmm. And although the government uh, didn't acknowledge that they were doing anything wrong about me, literally three months after that visit, I was allowed to go into exile. Yeah. And so you left uh, Argentina for, for the U.S.? Yes, I, I actually left for Europe because we were, uh, we were allowed to go into exile, literally, we were exp I, I was expelled. I was literally put on a plane. From the and jail my passport to the airport. Was given, yeah, my passport was given to the commander of the plane. Mm -hmm. I wasn't released in Argentina. I was literally mm -hmm. escorted to a plane. And in Paris, I met my wife and two children at that time. Mm -hmm. I had, we were, were waiting little, for you there. They were waiting for me in Brazil, actually, mm -hmm. and they joined me in Paris. And, uh, but from there, we came to the States because I had, uh, I had been a foreign exchange student here, and the family that uh, had hosted me uh, had campaigned you know, tirelessly to get me out of prison. And that's why I highlight in my book the solidarity mm -hmm. issue because yes, so yes. this family... And the connection and between detention, torture, and immigration, and exactly, solidarity. And solidarity, right. Mm -hmm. And so um, then you know, that kind of became the, the beginning of a career in human rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to work first in immigration issues in the, with a public interest law firm in Washington, and then to join Human Rights Watch when it was really just getting off the ground. Mm -hmm. And so I started working in the Western Hemisphere first, but then in the rest of the world as well. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go back uh, to Argentina? Did you, did you ever think about 
going back to Argentina and establish yourself again there? Yes, I did think about it, uh, but for the first six or seven years I couldn't go back because mm -hmm. if I went back I would have been rearrested. And um, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, for the whole dictatorship they had what they called the state of siege. Mm -hmm. And my condition for being allowed to go into exile was that if I returned, I had to go back to prison. So in 1983, I returned for the first time uh, when we had recovered democracy mm -hmm. already. Uh, and at that time, I kind of played with the idea of returning for good, and I had some offers to work with the human rights community mm -hmm. in Argentina. But for family reasons, we generally just stayed. Our children mm -hmm. were growing, mm -hmm. we're going to school here. My wife was becoming a lawyer in the mm -hmm. United States, as I had done before. Yeah. And so we stayed on. And, and at the same time, I was uh, beginning to work for Human Rights Watch, which mm -hmm. was a very exciting job. And I, I liked the fact that I was not working in my own country yes. alone, but in many other countries. And so in the end, I never returned. Yeah. I mean, I do return all the time, yeah. but not to live. So, and, and so do you feel that the way the, um, the, the afterward the, 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 the dictatorship time has been handled by the government in Argentina and so on and so on, do you think, because it, it remains a lingering problem. Yeah. I mean, do you feel that it has been handled well, or do you think that things have could have done better, and do you think that uh, the old wounds have been uh, looked after? No, I, I think uh, I'm very proud that uh, Argentine society has decided that it will not be deterred in seeking accountability for what happened during the, di the military dictatorship. It's a part of our history that we need to own up to, and owning up to that part of history uh, means, among other things, not only, but but especially uh, investigating and prosecuting everybody who was responsible for the for atrocities mm -hmm. like disappearances and torture and murder. Uh, what I would say, however, is that the process has gone up and down and has had, you know, uh, great achievements and then a lot of retrenching, yeah, yeah. and so it's been chaotic. Mm -hmm. But by and large, at this point, uh, Argentina and Chile are the countries where more accountability has happened than anywhere. More than in Uruguay? In, well, in, in Uruguay now they're beginning, but for years the, they, they let an amnesty law be the obstacle mm -hmm. for it. But, uh, but now with President Mujica just certifying another 80 cases, you know, for a small country like Uruguay, that's a, uh, certifying meaning that uh, under the law, the amnesty law that they have, it's called Ley de Caducidad, mm -hmm the president can certify cases as excluded from the amnesty. Mm -hmm. And President Tavares, uh, before... So people I'm can sorry, be potentially uh, prosecuted and so on. Fre president Tavares Vázquez, before Mujica, had actually certified a few cases. So mm -hmm. some cases were all... And Bordaberry, among others, yes. were being uh, convicted um, for human rights violations. But, but a lot of people were still protected by the amnesty. Mm -hmm. And now... Uh, Mujica has certified 80 cases, which for Uruguay is a big number. So they are breaking the the the, the cycle of impunity, mm -hmm. uh, but of course they've taken a long time to do it. Why has it been uh, uh, such a long process? Well, it's been long in all three countries, huh? yes. in Chile as well. I think for different reasons, uh, really. In the case of Argentina, because we did, uh, we achieved a lot at the beginning, then we had to yeah. retrench, then we have to start again, and we've gone back and forth. Uh, in the case of Chile, it has been a steady pace towards uh, achievement of accountability, uh, plus reparations, plus uh, truth-telling, plus institutional reform. Mm -hmm. In the, all three countries, that is happening. I would also mention Peru because the trial of yes. Mr. Fujimori is, you know, stands out as a great achievement in that sense as well. And I think in in Brazil they are beginning to to consider uh, ways around the amnesty law, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, creating a truth commission that President Rousseff is about to. But in Brazil, all these events took place in the 60s, so it's a long time ago. I mean, yeah. most of the people must have. They were the, the, they're a little earlier than in Argentina and Chile, yes, yes. but uh, but it, but it was uh, a prolonged yes. uh, dictatorship. So there are cases from the 70s as well. Yes. I think the 
the, the important thing is that uh, the societies don't let these things uh, you know, die yeah, yes. because the demand for justice is uh, really no, important. Is and, and I think in the case of Latin America what has happened is that the Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights mm -hmm. have contributed enormously to setting a kind of a normative framework for what mm. needs to happen when, you're, when a state, even a newly democratic state, confronts a legacy mm. of mass atrocity. A friend of mine has written a wonderful book called The Justice Cascade, mm -hmm. and she means by that that there's a point in which uh, what what is there, you know, kind of in the minds of some people uh, becomes an overwhelming turn towards a tipping point yeah. uh, and becomes a norm, a norm change, a, a kind of a change of paradigm, mm -hmm. if you will. And... Uh, I think that has happened with in, in, in the whole international community. It's not only the southern cone, but also uh, even, uh, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, uh, the ordinary course of business was letting bygones be bygones mm -hmm. and letting people get away with murder. Mm -hmm. That's no longer the case. And it's no longer the case not only in Latin America, but anywhere. And the fact that in the 90s, the international community created uh, ad hoc tribunals for the former yeah. Yugoslavia and Rwanda and then created the International Criminal Court has produced a veritable shift in paradigm and now uh, you put an end to conflict the way you can but uh, impunity for very serious human rights abuses is no longer it's part no of the solution.